viewpoint. Lots to cover tonight with the Treasurer, Scott Morrison. He joins us now live from Canberra. Thanks for joining us, Scott. G'day, Chris. Look, uh, first up, I want to get you on this uh, breaking story in the, the Fairfax media this evening, uh, looking back to the leadership uh, shenanigans of the year and suggestions that you were actually offered the Treasurer's job under a Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, back in February, on, on the eve of that spill that never really eventuated. Well, I think that's a pretty enthusiastic description of the conversation. No, that's not my recollection. I mean, there were a lot of phone calls taking place in what was a, a backbench-initiated event on that occasion, and uh, nothing came of that conversation. There was no outcome from that conversation. So I think people get a bit worked up over nothing. But there was a phone conversation with Malcolm Turnbull, and he did raise the idea of you serving as Treasurer. No, nothing came of this conversation. There was nothing really of that. That's not my recollection of how this took place. I mean, but you there seem are a lot to recollect some sort of conversation. At that time. You, you do recollect then speaking well, to Malcolm able... Turnbull? I, I, I do recollect talking to Malcolm Turnbull. He's a cabinet colleague of mine. It wasn't that extraordinary About that cabinet these leadership issues would talk and, to one and another. The Treasury I mean, it was a pretty. It was, a, it was a pretty you know, difficult time. I mean, we had a backbench initiated uh, spill motion at the time. I mean, that's almost a year ago now. I mean, I think, I think frankly, it's, uh, it's all well in the past. And, and I said nothing came of it. And there was no arrangement. There was no deal. There was no offers. There was none of this sort of stuff. I mean, I think it's just excited commentary. Um, and, you know, it's, it sounds like people are trying to get a lot out the door for, 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 for Christmas purchases in books. <laughs> There's a lot of that going on, but um, you are right. It is, it, 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 it is ancient history, and nothing did come of it in February. But from what you're saying, it sounds like you do recall a conversation with Malcolm Turnbull when the treasurer's job was raised with you. No, no I said there was, there was no offers. There was no nothing of what was described in, in those terms. So what I'm saying is, it, it, you know, it, it was a hypothetical that had no consequence. So, so it was a I hypothetical think, you know, that was just discussed. There was, there was no consequence, Chris. This is my point. You're well, getting was excited over nothing. I'm not excited. I'm interested, there was no though. Consequence. There was a consequence, actually, in September because he ended up becoming Prime Minister and you are now the Treasurer. Well, those two events are completely unrelated. They're completely unrelated. Uh, I mean, uh, that is a very long bow, Chris. I've, I've, I, I know you're trying hard and others are trying hard, <laughs> it's but a... I, I, I caution you. I mean, uh, you're going to start getting into all sorts of crazy conspiracy theories now. And before we get into that territory, I, I, I just say, mate, just take, have a good lie down. <laughs> I'm not particularly excited, but I also think it's a bit of a stretch to say that two leadership spill events in the one year are hardly unrelated events. And uh, this is the allegation well, is that you were talking about the, the Treasurer's bench. job in February and you did end up in the Treasurer's job come September. Well, here, here, here's a crazy idea. Perhaps I'm in the job because I'm the right person for the job right now and that uh, I'm doing this job based on merit. Now, that, I, know that's, I know that's a fairly, you know, unconventional media uh, analysis of things in this crazy town, uh, <laughs> but I'm focused on the job I've been given to do. And in my political career, I've always focused on getting results. I believe I've got those results in portfolios I've previously had responsibility for. And uh, I'm focused very much on the results of the economy and jobs. And I'll let all the conspiracy theorists and Christmas reading participants uh, to get about those businesses and I'll get about the budget. It is a crazy town as you say that's why I stay away from Canberra as much as possible but I'm up here in Sydney and yes obviously you're in the job on merit but I'm, I'm just suggesting it sounds like from what you're saying and I'm what we're I'm reading pleased you acknowledge it, that, Chris. it sounds like Malcolm Turnbull <laughs> recognised that you were man, the man for the job in February should he ever become Prime Minister. Well, look, that there matters for him. And, and look, the history is, has it that he, uh, after he became the Prime Minister, which is when people actually get to, you to offer you those positions, um, then he offered me that position and I was pleased to take it. Uh, uh, but the events of several months ago, um, you know, similar proposals were put to me on the same day by others. But look, all well, of pray that, tell, pray frankly, tell. is well in the yeah, past. Feel, I don't think Australian people could care less about this anymore. I think you're right. I think, uh, I think a lot of viewers are very interested in what's happening uh, with the country and the economy as well. I will leave, leave mm. those issues there uh, and come uh, back to a related question, I suppose, and that is if you could tell sure. us what is the most important policy change that has happened since Malcolm Turnbull took over as Prime Minister and you became Treasurer? 
Well, there hasn't just been one. We've had the response to the Harper Review, which really has set forward an agenda on microeconomic reform in this country, which will be incredibly important because over the next 10 years, we will not have the benefit of rising commodity prices in terms of trade. Uh, we, will, we will stand or fall based on our productivity performance. And the micro reforms that are at the heart of what the Harper Report was all about are critical. Now, equally, we had a response to the financial systems inquiry, and that is all about having a strong financial system to, to weather the storms and uh, we are facing headwinds at the moment but there are some tailwinds as well and so our economy is going through transition so whether it's those two uh, particular initiatives or the innovation statement that's now very very uh, uh, soon to announcement all of these are about trying to drive productivity performance drive our earnings potential and uh, all of these things I think are really saying to the Australian people that the government is building a strong platform for economic growth and jobs now we've also opened up discussions uh, with the states and territories about how we can have a better tax system and how we can have a better federation. Uh, all of this is incredibly important and, uh, and we're getting about those jobs. In fact, I, I would have said one of the most important things you've done and you've been able to do, I suppose, with the fresh leadership transition because it's a new Prime Minister, you've been able to turn your back to some extent on the commitments of the previous Prime Minister. You've basically said all options are on the table when it comes to economic well, reform, uh, budget repair and all that sort of thing. You've got mm. this taxation debate underway. We know there's talk about increasing the mm. GST and or extending it. When will we actually see a concrete proposal put to the Australian public about what you want to do on taxation? Well, the Australian people will know what's before them at the next election, and that's obviously the, the, the back-end timetable for any measures that the government would contemplate. But let's not forget why we're doing this. We're doing this because we want to see the economy grow and we want to see st strong jobs growth in the, in the economy. Um, Talking about tax from our side of politics is all about how you make the economy work better. Uh, when the Labor Party talks about taxes, they just want to have higher taxes. Uh, and, and they believe we have a revenue problem in this country, which means you have to increase the tax burden on Australians. Now, we don't share that view. We think when we do tax ch change the tax system, we, we do it to make it a better tax system well, then, and to, and you're, to you're, ensure you're, so that those... Your, your, your point on this has, has mirrored what Joe Hockey said for many years, and that is there is a spending problem in government, not a revenue problem. Now, can you guarantee then, whatever your taxation reform mix is, there will be no net increase in taxation? Well, it all depends what you mean by that. I mean, I mean, I mean if you grow that you the are economy, not going to take any more money. You're not going to, your tax increase well, overall is not going to increase. Well, of course, if you grow the economy, as occurred under John Howard and Peter Costello, your revenues rise. But you can have a better tax system that treads more lightly on taxpayers. And one of the problems we have is you've got uh, uh, average wage earners in this country going on to the second highest tax rate next year and paying 39 cents in the dollar on, their, on, on every extra dollar they're earning. Now, that is not a tax system that is uh, recognising and backing people who are working, saving and investing. And so the, the tax system needs to be able to back Australians, not frustrate them like it currently is. Now, if you can grow the economy and if you control expenditure, that's how you balance your budget. You don't do it by increasing the burden of taxes on individual taxpayers. Yeah, there must be a sense of urgency about this because the Coalition, of course, pointed out that over six years there was uh, no economic reform from Labor. Joe Hockey famously and Tony Abbott tried to introduce a lot of economic reform in that first budget, hit political and Senate brick walls and got very little done. So are you suggesting that we're going to have to wait another year before we see some any significant economic reform? Or are you going to take a, a decent and taxation, federation, perhaps industrial relations reform packages to an election in the first half of next year? Well, it's the Prime Minister who decides when the election is and he's said that the government will, will serve full term. I mean, we're already engaged in these reforms, Chris. They're, we're already engaged with them. I mean, the two, the two major uh, responses that I, I noted uh, so far over the last couple of months, the response to the financial system inquiry, which also had some pretty serious things to say about choice and, and, uh, and transparency in governance reform and superannuation, uh, that process is underway. Um, when it came to the Harper Review response, that process is already underway. So the reform is already happening. And we have a MIEFO, a budget update, which will uh, come out in December um, after the September national accounts, and that will enable us to, to you know, finally 
finalise uh, our forecasts and projections uh, and that'll come out. So, I mean, what we've been doing over the last few months with the, the, the Finance Minister and ERC is making sure that all of the policy measures that have been uh, um, announced since the last budget, and some of those were response type announcements such as the re refugee uh, and humanitarian support of, uh, of those 12,000 places or reversing the bank deposits tax, which was Labor's tax, uh, which they built into the Ford estimates and abolishing that. Um, and of course the innovation statement that's coming up. Uh, all of these things have to be paid for. So we've been doing the, the hard fiscal work to ensure uh, that there would be no net impact on the budget because of those policy announcements. Well, you mentioned then uh, talking about running full term, then the, the, you would be uh, on track to deliver your first budget in May um, next year. Given that Treasury has just written down its long-term growth forecast for the Australian economy, are you looking at uh, a blowout uh, even in this $35 billion budget deficit forecast for this year? And do you think that there's any possibility you're going you're, you're to have to delay the return to surplus, which is supposed to be 2019-30, 2019-20 at this stage? Well, you return to a surplus when expenditure is less than revenue, and I've said that before, and you just keep working towards that point. I, I'm not going to sort of play the game that um, previous um, occupants of this chair, particularly the Labor Party, did, uh, making all sorts of uh, bold projections about timetables. I mean, it is, a, it is a task you apply yourself to every day in this job, and uh, what you make sure you do is if, that if you are having new commitments, like our innovation statement, or, or getting rid of taxes, which is what we do, uh, like the bank deposits tax, then you have to make sure that washes its face in the budget, and that's what Matthias and I and the rest of the team have been doing. Now, there are other impacts on the budget, uh, parameters estimates and um, things that happen with commodity prices and so on which work into the forecasts and the projections and they I mean you don't go chasing those sorts of things down the hole I mean you can se severely damage the economy by doing that uh, you, you look after the integrity of what you're seeking to spend and, uh, and and making sure that's paid for and then you then you have to manage that within the broader changes happening in the economy but you made the point about what Treasury has done let me be clear what Treasury has done is dealt with one of the inputs into the projection model that they run on the economy. And what they're saying is, is because of um, slower immigration growth and population growth, that the rate of growth GDP uh, real that you have to grow at uh, to remain at that full employment level when you reach it again is now 2.75%. Now that's not a forecast of what the economy is going to grow by, that is just one of the inputs that go into the projection model that they use. Now I want to be very sure that when we get to my EFO this year that we have a very, I think a very robust but I think a very honest outlook because Australians know we have, we have volatility globally, Australians yeah. know that we're transitioning from the high mining investment phase of the economy into a new phase. And Glenn Stevens has noted that the economy actually is starting to broaden out. But those capex figures last week, they were, they were disappointing. They were at the very um, the worst end of the spectrum. But it's no shock to us that we're coming out of a high mining investment at, um, period of our economy and that the non-mining sector investment, it, there'll still be some time before we see that pick up. Well, just Australians the, know that. They're transitioning. They do. They, they, Australians want honesty on this. They don't want people promising full yeah. budget surpluses and, and not delivering any. So, you, you know, you, you're off ahead. Uh, sure. Yeah, that, that's a pretty low bar you've got to better. Mm. Just looking at the cost, input, <laughs> cost inputs here, you're talking about you're focused on, on costs. We know Malcolm Turnbull's going to Paris mm. tomorrow. He's going to be talking about the 26% mm. to 28% emissions reduction mm. target for Australia. We know, of course, there's a renewable energy target that you're committed to of 23%. We know, of course, about direct action. Do you have an overall mm. view, uh, an overall global figure of what that emissions reductions target is going to cost the Australian government? Across all those well, various measures. What we're yeah, well, over and above what we're currently doing, my advice is it's between 0.2 and 0.3%. Of GDP. Now, this is a this is a real cost, and that's why I don't think you rush into these decisions lightly. And I think we would be foolish to say uh, that uh, the commitments that are being made in Paris don't come without a cost. They do. Um, but what what the Labor opposition are suggesting is going to cost the economy uh, more than six hundred billion dollars over fifteen years. I mean, this is. This is just extraordinary stuff. I mean, they're going to reduce emissions by crashing the economy. I mean, this is a carbon tax. How, how are they going to do that? I mean, they're, they're, they're effectively talking about doubling the renewable energy target and doubling, almost doubling the emissions reductions target. So aren't they effectively going to be close enough to doubling the cost? 
Well, the, well the, as I've told you, I mean, they already had the, the Climate Change Commission, which did those figures, which they, I remember, ran on the front page of the, uh, when it was leaked out of the uh, shadow cabinet, and they denied that was going to be their view. Well, it clearly was their view, and uh, they're quite happy to take an axe to the economy uh, to pursue um, their, their views on, on climate change. I mean, I think there is a rational, reasonable, measured response, which is what the Prime Minister and Greg Hunt and Julia Bishop are taking to Paris, and then you've got the sort of the, the overreaction that you're seeing from Bill Shorten, chasing the Greens and chasing, you know, anyone he can find for support on the left um, to try and um, shore up his position. And look, I just think it's a very reckless response from, from the opposition and it would damage our economy considerably. I mean, it's, it's basically a, a, a jobs tax that he's talking about. We want to grow the economy. Bill Shorten seems to be wanting to do all he can uh, to crash it. I'd like to talk to you. Uh, you know, there, there's so much more I'd like to ask you about, but we better let you go. There's just one other oh. issue I, I'll get from you before you go, though. As a former immigration minister, yeah. you must have been concerned to mm. see that that asylum seeker boat turned up within sight of Christmas Island last week. Would this have been people smugglers testing out the new Prime Minister? Well, they're always having a crack now and then, my understanding is. And, um, and what's important is that there's no change in the policy and there's no change in the resolve. And, you know, they got the same outcome that everyone else got. And there's, I'm not surprised by that. Um, and, you know, Malcolm and I had discussed these issues over many years in opposition and in government. And he'd always been as strong on this as, uh, as uh, the former Prime Minister. So, um, look, we, as a team, I think people sometimes forget this. I mean, I appreciate the fact that people credit my time in that job with stopping the boats and, and that was my responsibility. But it was done as a cabinet, it was done under the leadership of the Prime Minister Tony Abbott and but the whole team was backed into this approach and so I'm not surprised that we haven't skipped a beat and Peter Dutton's doing a great job there and I work closely with him. So look, anyone who was thinking of getting on any vessel, they're going to find the same outcome that everyone else had since we come to government and it all come to naught. Scott Morrison, thanks very much for joining us on Viewpoint again. Thanks a lot, Chris. Good to be with you.